that was all chilling time. Uh, if anybody got any questions or any, any, you know, just just thoughts, pushback, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for this. I got the end. I just, based on what I heard, it, it was really helpful to me because I've been also thinking a lot around gentrification and like how people in their 20s and 30s uh, have a lot of Asian American creative friends moving into traditionally black neighborhoods in Brooklyn. And what does that mean? And I feel like some of these principles maybe can help outline like what it means to be a gentrifier versus trying to maybe take a step and contribute or listen or follow or I don't know, but I feel like there might be some parallels. Yeah, I think so. I think like, uh, so. So uh, one thing that I said at the beginning um, was uh, this is specifically with regards to my experience as an Asian American in hip hop, but my hope is that it is generalizable, that there's some universal principles whenever there's a cultural interchange taking place. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Word. Uh, anyone else? Yes, sir. How do you, um, if you see something or someone and it looks like there's a situation of appropriation occurring, uh, if it's the first time you've seen this person, then maybe it's hard that you don't know, and maybe that's the time you just are you might just keep your mouth shut and let this be. But if it's wherever it may be, and this person again, how do you feel, or how do you approach the topic of appropriation with someone who does that make sense? How do you call somebody out without like <clears throat> immediately going into conflict mode? Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I feel you because. I mean, my, my guys know, like, I'm, I'm always ready to swing. Um, <laughs> which, not helpful. Okay. It's hip-hop. Bro, it's a lot. Yeah, but it, it, it is, it is. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a hard conversation, right? Because I, there is so much you got to read, right? As an artist, I know it's all about reading the room, right? Some people just don't give a fuck, bro. They're just like, yo, I'm just having fun, whatever, whatever. Some people, it's not, in my opinion, it's not even worth entering into the combo because it's not going to be a combo, right? It's going to be, they already actually know. I mean, I'm also sometimes too fatalistic and not hopeful enough, but sometimes, like, I got so many different buckets to put my energy into. I'm trying to put my energy into the buckets where change is actually happening. Right, so I will say for me sometimes, this is where my life is at, just my life and my time and my energy. Sometimes for me, even these combos are more internal. It's, it's less like I see you on the street and you're going yada, 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 or you know, whatever, whatever. And I'm gonna call you out. Or, oh, you're kind of in my circles and I see you doing this, but I don't really know you. Um, to a certain degree, it's more, right? I said, I, okay, so I said initially, right? It's an ethical question. We're actually talking about ethics. The problem with ethics is that people start from different fundamental assumptions. If your fundamental assumptions are different than mine, it takes a lot of work if you want to change your fundamental assumptions. And if you don't, it's damn near impossible, right? So maybe this is hopeless, but these days it's more like, yo, I see a room full of people right here who care. And we're already still fucking it up a lot. So, just to me, if we can sophisticate and, and sharpen our conversation and get better and better at what we do, that's a win. That's, that's pushing the ball forward still. Um, and you know, like, Iggy Azalea is gonna be out there Iggy Azalea, you know what I'm saying? Like, that don't got nothing to do with me. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, don't. The, the, uh, the, 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 the good book <laughs> says don't throw your pearls before swine. And, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, all right. Anyone else? Anyone else? Oh, man, lots of pop. All right, we're we going to go pop like that. Just want to give you a lot of pop. So, what I've seen is what I've been through. To understand where the appropriation or seeing what I wanted to do, 
had to learn to appreciate. It. So it just it does it does connect, and and and, and I, I see it when we started talking about it, and from when when we came to the uh, to the uh, apprenticeship for me to now that all the experience I've taken in is like uh, for me to build the bridge between of, of, of my culture and, and the culture of, of, of what I'm doing now. It's it, I, I see the the, the 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 connection to it. You know, people actually when you start doing the culture, the people when you start doing it, people actually approach, uh, approach you and say, "Wow, I've never seen like you do stuff like that." But I'm like saying, "You do see it. <laughs> you do see it." But it's just you know. And then to, uh, to uh, authenticate it, it's like, uh, it's like I, I, I want it, so now I'm giving it back. So now I'm teaching. So now it's my responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, to teach the culture back, no matter what race you are. And, you know, as long as you have that knowledge or responsibility, teach it to somebody else. They'll pass it on, and definitely it'll, it'll grow and, you know, instead of being just one place. Yeah, and, and you know, I don't think it's no coincidence, right, that like genealogies, uh, so you know, like I'm, I'm religious and like, you know, both Old Testament and New Testament and, and the Christian scriptures start with a genealogy, right? Or you look at like martial arts and it's always, oh, my master was this, who, who studied with this, who came from this, who came from this town, who came from this master, right? And you look at, and I know even like how Zulu Nation still works, you know, like in, in all these cultures, when we forget that lineage, that's when, because I'm going to say, you know, like, I think you came up at a time, uh, for those who don't know, this is DJ Rolly Rowe, this, like, legend, like, New York turntablist, uh, fifth platoon member, you know what I'm saying, like, like legend, legend. And, and Ro, I think when you was coming up, it was only the embodied experience. And yet it was, like, CDs and shit, you know, and, and vinyl. But now with, like, the internet, you know what I'm saying, I think, like, now there's ways that people think they can take the phone. Like, back then, you know, you saw somebody. I seen it. You know, yeah, I'm on. But the thing is, I mean, it's, to me, I I I I I, I categorize that as future music because I mean, there's yeah. there's the original music, you know, which what we do, and even before me, let's just say that you know, Living It is before me or Grandmaster Flash, you know, yeah. I was a theater, and then you know, I was in the seventies and the eighties. Grandmaster DXT. Um. I'm the 90s, you know, so I have to admit that because I'm not part of the 90s. And then now there's the future, and I have to see the future of what they do. So whatever I do in my culture, and they want to, they, 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 they would ask me, how do I get involved with this, with, 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 with this set, this future music that I'm doing? And I would teach it to them, and they would combine the both, like what they know and what I know. It's just a whole new level, you know? and then they would take that and teach it to somebody else. It's a good thing. Exactly. Right, right, right. This interchange isn't just horizontal; it's also vertical. Yeah. And we got to remember that we all come from vertical cultures. Yeah. There was another right here. Yeah, I, I had a question about you being a creator. Yes, sir. And your journey. I, I, I love that slide. That road and path to authenticity. So. I, I guess my question to you is, are you, as a creator, I think, it, I think it, obviously the, that destination of authenticity is probably paramount to your work and the ethics, but is it something you're constantly having to authenticate, or did you reach a point where you say, I am authentic, or is it like a matter of like, I have responsibility, I'm teaching, so like, I am authentic because I am teaching, like even now you're teaching, so like, you know, or is it, is this a constant struggle, are you always trying to authenticate? You know, just like you, know, you have some guy show up and he comes up to you and asks you a question, I have to authenticate. I'm just wondering what your personal experience in, you know, in hip hop, like what is your, I don't know, this 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 question of authenticity. I, I'm just wondering, is this a constant struggle, or is it like you feel authentic now, or will you ever feel that, or do you hope that in the future I don't have to worry about my authenticity? I, that's my question. Great question. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would say actually. Uh, the authenticity, right, the nature of what I'm discussing, 
it's actually an internal uh, verification, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and now we've got to be careful, right? Because sometimes we think we're cool, but then <laughs> we're not, you know? But yes, I mean, the balance between, of course, internal validation and authenticity versus yeah. external, you just like, you know, you, you have, you have relationships with people that's giving you that authenticity. So I'm just, mm -hmm. you know, wondering if that, your internal struggle with your specific case, how that is. Yeah, I, I would say like, uh, for me these days, it's like, 98% of my life, I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'm, like I know myself. I was talking, I was driving with Leo yesterday, and I was like, bro, the craziest thing is now I know myself. Like I know who I am, and I don't gotta have that sort of microsecond in an interaction where I'm like, oh, who do they see me as? I don't even fucking want. I'm like, I, I see, I, I know who I am, right? But then the other two percent is friction points, right? Like, ask, like you know. Am I being appropriative? You know, like there's there's times uh, like treading that line of am I doing something that benefits me more than the, at the cost of the culture, or am I? Uh, let me think. Examples examples are like um, okay. So you know, uh, so we do bilingual hip hop. Um, I track through night market. Uh, we do uh, Mandarin, Chinese, and English uh, trap hip hop. And we went through a lot of rounds of conversation about why are we incorporating Chinese in our music? Is it Orientalism? Is it exoticism? Is it appealing to the white gaze? Is it appealing to market conditions? Uh, we landed on, you know what, it's fun for us, it's real for us, and it comes inside out. But you know, there's those moments where, and, and this is why, again, relationships is so important because it's, you, like just in life, forget the appropriation conversation, in life, and, and I'm sure you know this, we gotta have people who are willing to check us and willing to say like, nah, that's crossing a line. Like, uh, or we, we gotta have an internal check, we gotta have external checks. Um, like for me, like I said again, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm religious, and there was a point I was like, yo, man, I thought it would be kind of tight to have like a Jesus piece. Like, you know, this was back when Kanye was wearing like the, the Goodwood one, the plastic Jesus, the the, the Murakami Jesus. And I was like, oh, that shit looks tight. Uh, ben Baller did Black Jesus for him. And, and I was living in China, so I could easily go out and like find whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I came down to, you know, I had some problems with some friends, and I was like, you know what? Like, that's. That's not how my religion works. Like, I'm not trying to use Jesus to make me look cooler. Um, and just to have those real combos with a couple people around me who knew my heart, who, who are aware of situations, help me swerve. And, and the parallel there, right, is that would have been an, an inauthenticity to myself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you get what I'm saying, right? You, yeah, yeah, that all scans. Yeah, yeah, so that's what I just wanted your personal story or your journey towards authenticity and how you navigate that. I think it's obviously different for everyone who's got their own. Definitely. Definitely. So I just... Yeah. Well, okay, so, so last anecdote I'll give and then I'll, I'll get to you over there. Um, so uh, a couple months ago, uh, I had a, a, a very small subset, and not many of them. There was like one Twitter thread. Twitter, it's great. Um, <laughs> so I had uh, a, a certain group of black folks come at me. Uh, they're part of this ADOS movement. Uh, American descendant of slaves, um, and so uh, one one uh, black lady shared a music video that I did with the homie, and she was like, "Yo, this is kind of tight, blah blah blah." And then uh, this this group of folks uh, kind of jumped on and was like, "Yo, you know, they're just taking this, they're just taking this, yada 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 yada, right?" Um, and in that moment, you know, I mean, it's Twitter, so I wasn't taking it too personal, but also that was a check for me, right? I was like, "All right." Am I really real, or are they right? Like, you know, like, I'm, I'm not gonna assume that they're wrong. But I mean, in the combo that came out, what, what I said was these appeals to kind of what we're saying. Like, you don't know who I've been with and where I've walked, and in what ways I've walked in those places. Like, y'all wasn't with me when I was walking down Fulton, you know what I'm saying? Yo, uh, you know, like, when I was in the, in the VX with, with the low lowlifes, you know, getting, like, taught the game. Y'all wasn't with me when I was rolling around New Haven. Uh, and Shimo's Acura, like, you know, like, just, just chopping it up. Y'all wasn't with me uh, when I was in Oaktown, like, you know, walking around Lake Merritt, 
with like the locals, you know, putting me up on game, putting me up on gentrification there, putting me up on like this, the, the issues. And so I realized what came out in that moment as, as my defense was, was exactly this, was the relationships. And it's relationships. It's not, I took, it's, it, and I realized that the fact that I have this give and take is to me what gives me peace of mind. Because not, ju not just as a, as a gold star to be like, oh, look who I'm friends with, but as a, I know these people, if I was fucking up, they would tell me. And, and if they're telling me you're good when you come to the Elm City, you're good when you come to Oakland, I don't take that lightly because I know they don't take that lightly. Yeah, yes, that's what I'll say. My question is pretty similar, actually. <laughs> oh, word, word. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess like I was gonna ask from your personal experience, so what like what were some significant like moments in your life to get you to such like a nuanced kind of perspective and experience? Like a lot of these things, like, I I definitely learned a lot from what you were sharing, um, and stuff that helped me to think a lot. But I also acknowledge that not everybody is as involved. Um, or as mixed with other different kinds of people, um, and so they don't always have the opportunities, or even if they have relationships with other people, those people might not be as involved in mm -hmm. these kind of matters as well, and so I don't know. And so I was kind of wondering, like, either if you have some significant moments from your personal experience that, like, other people you might be able to have that might lead them, you know, towards this kind of complex, nuanced understanding, or something that kind of might be helpful towards that line. Definitely, definitely. Um, uh, I'll, the first thing that comes to my mind is I've always been a person that's attracted to the margins rather than the centers. Uh, I just think more interesting things happen at the margin. Um, and so, margins are places of exchange, right? They're liminal spaces, literally. Uh, centers are spaces of consolidation and institutionalization. Um, and I think that that marginal orientation uh, throughout my life has been what kind of propels this all forward because you have to have these kind of, uh, the, uh, as any, uh, is anybody here planning to watch uh, Utomo's Parasites? Eventually. Is it okay if I spoil one line of dialogue? <laughs> 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 It's, it's not a plot point. It's not a plot point. Um, there is a point in the film where one character says to another character, money is an iron. It, 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 it cleans out all the wrinkles from someone's life. And that's how I feel about centers. Uh, centers of power and the people who find themselves there and stay there and choose to stay there. Um, not subversively that's actually bringing the margin into a center. But those who choose to preserve a center and buy into it, it becomes an iron. And it smooths out the wrinkles and the differences. And this is, again, where I was saying neoliberal multiculturalism. That being generated from a center of power, what it does is it smooths out things. This is why we have ethnic studies, not racial studies. Right? Because ethnicity is fun. Everybody <laughs> loves Chusok and Diwali and the Lunar New Year, and you know, we don't really celebrate Juneteenth because that gets into race. Um, everybody loves ethnicity and culture. Race terrifies people because race is a wrinkle, right? And, and with this multicultural iron, we can smooth out the wrinkles and be like, oh, you dress like that, that's amazing. Oh, you take off your, oh, you don't take off, like, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> but then when we get into, again, polyculturalism, versus multiculturalism. And instead of saying, oh, you're Korean and I'm Chinese, so I'm gonna learn about you, when we're actually attempting to exist together and, and not fuse, you know, it's not a melting pot, it's, it's a salad bowl. Weird shit comes up, it's like, oh, so you get, I guess a, a banana and zucchini don't taste good together. Sauce. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, well then which element do we not put in? Or do we spice it different? Or do we fry the banana? And cut it up. And you know what I'm saying? Like, it's easy when it's like, oh, here's a banana, here's a zucchini. But if you're trying to bring it together, you gotta be clever with it. 
And so for me, that's the beauty. For me, it was hip hop. That you know, black, brown kids, white kids, Asian kids, like that. That was that attractive, magnetic thing. Um, but you know, a lot of people don't, and that's I'm well, going to say that's wrong. Like I'm not pushing whatever. Like no, you can totally just be. We've got a lot of them in LA. You can totally just be a Korean dude in Koreatown, dating a Korean person, going to a Korean church. That's fine. But it's a blessing to be on the margin. And for those of us who find ourselves there and, 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 and make it sustainable, it just enriches our lives. But if, if, if that's not what you're trying to do, I'm not going to be the one to say, you got to do it. That's corny. Like, no. Okay, no work. Uh, any, any others? Any others? A lot of these questions center around a question of like internal authenticity. And I sort of wonder from a more external perspective, and it's kind of like a big question. Like, it's everything from like, how do you feel about BTS to like the Aquafina Blackson conversation to like, how do we more broadly, like, we can see within ourselves and do the work within ourselves, but there's like a there's society happening around us. And if we have this analysis and understanding, what do we do about that? How do we interact with it? And are there points in which we should be like, should we out? Shouldn't we? Or like, are certain things too far gone? Like, you see what I'm saying? I guess like, can we keep on sort of the external? Right, right. I, I think I think I, I understand that. I'll say, um, I think that uh, right. I mean, some things we gotta fight for. Like some there's there's times when uh, you know, like, like I said, usually I'm just like, you know what? I'm I'm a I'm a water my garden. You know, I'm not gonna worry about yours. But there's sometimes when it boils over. Right. Uh, I mean, shit is crazy right now. Shit is not good right now. Um, and uh, right, then, then, then how do we engage in it? I mean, I do think that. Uh, so, so last night we were walking back. We were walking from one after party to the other, and <laughs> we, we, and and I, I was talking um, with one of the homies about. Uh, I was talking about exactly like when do we choose to engage in what? And I think first of all, like there's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, but then there certainly are elements that that you have to sometimes things are urgent, things are pressing. There's a cultural conversation that needs to be advanced. Um, but I think that it's okay. Well, let me check. In. How are these? Is this working at all? Or like, what are you? What are you feeling? What do you want to ask? I think here? I've identified a more specific question, Great. which is sort of like when we talk about this work and when we're doing it internally and we're trying to do it right. There's so many like large social things that are doing it wrong, like the way that like hip hop has been appropriated by pop music more generally, and then the Asian pop music industry in a very like specific way, mm -hmm. and like when these broader trends are occurring, right, like how does someone, similarly to gentrification, like I can move out of my gentrifying neighborhood and like that, but that doesn't stop gentrification, right? Like I can even be like a conscious participant in my neighborhood, but that's not, that's not the same thing. It's not about being enough, right? Yeah. It's that those are sort of different actions related to a similar analysis of structure. Yeah. All right. Uh, word. Word. Um, again, this is me speaking for myself. This is, uh, I'm not. I'm not a sustainable development expert. Um, uh, what is it? J.R. Tolkien, right, author of the Lord of the Rings, has this concept of uh, what he calls the long defeat, uh, and he says that the point of life, we're actually not going to win. He's like, there's too much shit in this world. We're not going to win. What we are doing though is we're fighting the battles because they're worth fighting. We're fighting the battles to slow down the ugly in the world from overtaking. And it's going to, like, in and out of our own. And, and this is going to be the most unhelpful answer, perhaps. <laughs> this is why I'm religious. This is why I'm religious, because she is too crazy to, like, I, I have to, and and so for again, so me very personally, not 
letting anybody believe in anything. Uh, I see my role as I'm trying to do my best. Sometimes my best will not be good enough. And, and best, I don't mean like, oh, I tried, I guess we'll give up. No, we strategize, we march, we're smart about it. Uh, my mentor, uh, my landlady, my mentor, uh, she's a Sunset woman. She works in uh, lobbying, uh, legislation, grassroots organizing. Um, you know, we're smart about it. We've got to learn redistricting. We've got to learn all these things. we got to learn, you know, cultural competencies. And then at certain times, a billionaire is just going to be like, well, you know what, I'm going to buy SM Entertainment. And now we're just going to push K-pop acts across Billboard. And guess how we're going to market them? Oh, like this cool, weird thing, right? Sometimes that shit just happens. Our responsibility isn't to beat them. Our responsibility is to surf, ride the waves, stay, stay, stay afloat. You know, when, when we see other people who fell off their board, you know, pick them up as we can. But I think that the task of, of winning, of solving, and we'll have victories, but the overarching task of like solving the shit of this world, like this, what this country did to natives is never gonna be undone. Like, and we can give, you know, land acknowledgements. We can invest in native-owned businesses, but we're just never gonna undo what should have been. Um, and so we try to push the ball forward and we, as we can. And then I go to sleep and I just, you know, and that's why when rarely I do, I pray. And I just, you know, it's, it, it's beyond me now. It's above me now. Quote a very good viral video. You know, it's just <laughs> at a certain point it's out of my hands. And that's a very unhelpful answer. But that's how I get to my days. Uh, does that make some? Yeah, no, it doesn't take a lot of things. Or you may have just learned more about me than you needed to. <laughs> <laughs> we have one last question, or are we. Anybody? I have a question. I... Sure, you know, we'll, we'll do one and then two. About that. Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah, we'll have one to you. Yeah. Um, so, I know you're Chinese American, and you have flipped. I mean, low key, actually, hip hop artists in China kind of know a lot. Actually, there's there's a lot like people. I mean, Kevin knows all about this, but like actually, the guys running the scene, unfortunately, you know, it's all cisgender males. But uh, the guys running the scenes across China, pretty legit. Like uh, the Godfather, one of the Godfathers, Spazzo. You know, like one of the Godfathers of hip hop in Beijing is a uh, Chinese Canadian dude from Toronto. So he grew up in the mix. You know, the dude running shit in Shanghai, uh, black dude from Detroit. Um, so actually, so there's commercialized hip hop, you know, Chris Wu, I don't know who's in his ears, you know, like anybody who's like a top 10 artist in the hip hop charts in China, I don't know who's in their ears. But the underground scene is actually very flourishing. Um, there's a lot of nationalism in it, unfortunately, <laughs> but I mean, flip side, like, it's not like American, any culture is free of nationalism either, right? Um, so I would say like, and you know, like we was just sitting, like uh, one of our homies, he's, he's a DJ in Beijing, he books uh, hip hop clubs in Beijing. This man knows and cares so much. Like he's walked through Detroit, he's walked through Compton. Like he's, you know, I mean obviously he's a foreigner in a different land, so he's not gonna know what we know here. But I would actually say I feel very low responsibility uh, because I think they're doing a good job. Like. You know, like they're actually, they're fighting for the soul of their culture, of their hip hop culture out there. Um, but uh, I actually don't, 
feel too much of a relief. Like, I feel like we got our shit handled here. Our cousins over there, they got their shit handled over there. Um, and from what I can tell, they're not doing a bad job of it. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then, one last one. I don't, I don't want to know how to word my question For sure. right now. All good? I don't matter. Yeah. Usually. <laughs> I guess I could try. <laughs> so, so. Um, so the slide you had up where it had the list, kind of like the, the flow going from Yeah, I think actually that's a very good question. Um, everything is contextual, right? And obviously I'm, I'm extremely American. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely I would say that this narrative is a narrative rooted in personal experience and an observed experience, which is primarily in America. Now, uh, this last week in LA, I had one of my very good friends from Beijing, uh, this white girl from the Bay Area. Uh, she's an ethnomusicologist. She's actually currently embedded in Tanzania. She's lived in Tanzania for four and a half years. She speaks uh, fluent Swahili now, uh, like, like local Swahili, um, not folks Swahili. And uh, we was talking about how, and, and I, I actually didn't mention that she didn't even know I'd be this workshop, but it's been a kind of similar journey for her. I would actually say she started off at appreciation. Um, uh, as an ethnomusicologist, she was already highly aware uh, as she entered in. But I, I do see structural similarities between my path uh, and other paths, and then, and then her work. Um, you know, she's not, she's not in Tanzania to observe and to report and to research and then to go home. Like, she's home there, you know? Um, so for anybody who's doing cultural interchange in non-American contexts, I would still encourage them to, you know, consider this pathway uh, in these directions. But uh, you're right. I mean, every tool has to be adapted. Like you know, um, every, everything has to be reworked for your context. Uh, but I do still have some, you know, secondhand evidence that it's a very similar road, uh, even elsewhere. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, I think we're supposed to go eat some cheesesteaks, and then we got to play. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Uh, my name's Jason. It was great to be with y'all. This. This was part of the hip hop programming that we've offered for the last six years of this film festival. So, uh, we want to shout out to the child.
you know, musician who's coming at it with their real authentic voice. We're opening up the door for people to come in here and share space and engage in what we're doing so that this structure that exists, right, like structural racism is part of capitalism. And like, until we can all unite and say, like, capitalism's whack, like, we're not going to get rid of racism, right? But the more people that come together and say, you know, these things that are dividing us are actually just, you know, facets of this other structural inequity, then, like, you know, we're not going to get to that point. But I would say, again, like, the, the work that you're doing, like, both through the music and through the, the kind of lecturing that you're doing is helping with that. So thank you again for that. Thank you.